Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, allotting so much time and taking every single question posed to you. Uh, I want to uh, first maybe just pick up with what my friend and colleague asked. Could you characterize the Americans that are still there? I, I know there are a lot of them that didn't necessarily want to come back. There were there's a whole array of different reasons. Could you give us a better understanding of those that have remained and what their circumstances are? Certainly. Um, the senators, we've noted, uh, starting back in, in March, uh, we issued 19 separate messages to any uh, American citizen who was registered with the embassy, uh, urging them uh, to, to leave Afghanistan, to avail themselves of commercial uh, flights uh, that were running, offering uh, assistance uh, if they needed it, because we knew it was a very volatile uh, security environment. Uh, and as especially when we uh, went, started the ordered departure of our embassy on uh, April 27th, it's also very incumbent upon us to make sure that uh, we are um, making clear to any American citizens uh, that uh, they should take the opportunity uh, to leave. By the time of the evacuation, despite these 19 um, separate messages, uh, there were still somewhere around five or 6,000 uh, American citizens left in, in Afghanistan. And as we've noted earlier, we never know whether it's Afghanistan or any other country around the world at any given moment how many American citizens are there because uh, they're not, no one is required when you travel abroad, when you reside abroad, you're not required to register with uh, the embassy uh, or with anyone else. Many people do, many don't. Uh, but we made a, a, a massive effort to try to determine how many people were there. So uh, the reason, but, to get to your point, the reason that despite uh, all of these warnings, despite um, the environment, uh, people remained is because uh, for virtually all of them, Afghanistan was their home. They'd lived there for years, for decades, for generations, their extended family was there. And it is the most wrenching of all decisions to have to decide whether or not to leave the place I wanted that, to ask you know as home. I wanted to give more texture to this complex yeah. situation. This is not that there were people there, there, there are many people that fall into the category of not being abandoned by our country, but have made the conscious choice to stay in country, correct? That's correct. Um, you, you, you have been, I've only been here eight years, mm. but I will say uh, to you and your staff, you have been the most responsive State Department team that my office has dealt with. We have brought many, as you know, people to your attention, both American citizens and Afghanis who wanted to get out, have worked with us uh, to, uh, to many different degrees of success, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I have now witnessed uh, with my senior senator, uh, we went to our joint base and saw the facilities being done for those who have met uh, extreme vetting and have made it to the United States, what is going on with the 13,000 expected in New Jersey and the 65 to 70,000 is America at its best. I met from military personnel, the State Department personnel, talking to me about this being some of the proudest work they've ever done. And I think Americans uh, should be aware of that and what's going on. We are a great nation, and this is a, a reflection of those words on the Statue of Liberty. Um, I want to pick up, though, on uh, the situation as it is. I think it was uh, Senator Merkley who brought up uh, the concerns about humanitarian yeah. uh, interest, a humanitarian uh, crisis that is, that is really boiling over there. And uh, I want to just get you to reiterate uh, that uh, you, you issued one license, uh, but we, we really need more, correct? Yeah, I understand that, and that's exactly what we're looking at. We want to make sure that all the authorities exist to provide that humanitarian assistance, uh, including by uh, not just our own uh, NGOs, but, uh, but others as well. And it's a strategic uh, situation. We know we control significant resources the Afghan government has been relying on to run basic services. This is a strategic leverage that we have over the Taliban uh, to continue uh, to try to pressure them into honoring human rights, honoring the rights of women, mm -hmm. uh, 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 countering uh, uh, some of the terrorist concerns that we have, and it's very important. However, given what we understand, without those resources, there are going to be continued uh, humanitarian suffering. As New York Times reported, um, the World Food Program is estimating about 40% of Afghans' crops are going to be lost. There's going to be tremendous hunger as the price of wheat is expected to go up 25%. 
Uh, the World Food Program's own food stock is expected to run out uh, by September. Uh, and so this is tremendous suffering that will come. Uh, it's going to be exacerbated by climate change. Uh, we can literally see uh, issues of starvation hitting the general population. Uh, I, I guess if you can give me specifically, what assurances has the Biden administration been able to secure from the Taliban as it, remarks, as it is to humanitarian access? Um, and how is the State Department working with international partners? Because it's not just our responsibility uh, to coordinate and provide near-term and long-term assistance for those Afghans who've ended up uh, in locations without the proper support mechanism. Yeah. Uh, first, you're exactly right, I think, to, to draw a distinction between basic humanitarian assistance to, to respond to what is uh, a crisis uh, among so many Afghan people. Uh, by the UN's estimates, uh, well over 50 percent are in need of humanitarian assistance. We've had a, we've had a drought. We've had uh, horrific economic conditions. Uh, we've had uh, COVID, everything piling on uh, to one of the poorest countries on earth to begin with. So when it comes to food, when it comes to medicine, uh, when it comes to the basics, um, the, we, the international community, uh, irrespective of anything else, uh, ought to be able to provide that, provided that we can do it uh, knowing that the assistance is going to get to the people uh, who need it uh, and not diverted or used uh, in, any other, uh, in any other way. Uh, we have longstanding uh, mechanisms and arrangements in place, including with leading NGOs, including with the UN agencies, to do just that, as well as very clear monitoring mechanisms to make sure even in an environment that we don't control, uh, that assistance gets to the people uh, who need it. And I spent time with the, the head of the uh, UN agency responsible for that uh, to make sure that that's what's happening. We're coordinating with dozens of countries on this. Uh, the UN is playing a lead role. We, they just had a donors conference to make sure that everyone else is, is feeding into this as well. I just want to end by saying thank you to uh, uh, many of the State Department personnel still in that region, as well as here in the United States, that are working uh, through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Rounds, I understand, is with us.